All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you for being here tonight. My name is Catherine McGuire. I am the chair of the Department of Communication. And again, I am so glad that so many of you could be here today. Uh, it's been a super trying time for all of us. Uh, but everyone has, right, has risen to the challenge, our faculty have risen to the challenge, our students have risen to the challenge, our staff have. And so I've been so proud of what we've been able to do today. So the purpose of tonight is to get you a preview of what the fall is going to look like uh, as far as how the department has planned the classes. Um, and so what we're gonna do is, uh, again, just a few housekeeping. As I said, we are recording this uh, call and we'll be posting it on the website for those who couldn't make it tonight. We will also um, be available to answer questions long after this moment. So if you uh, have questions now and want to be able to get in contact with us, we will make sure that uh, you can find our contact information very easily on the website. So this is not the end of the questions. This is just uh, a way for us to start the conversation. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, the Dean of the College of Fine Performing Arts, Matt Seeger, who's going to kind of talk to us a little bit about the Dean's level perspective. After that, I'll come back on and just talk to you about how we made decisions about this coming fall and the process that happened. Then I'll turn it over to Vicki Dallas, who will then um, go through what the different teaching uh, methods are and how to look at it in the um, course schedule. And then I'll turn it over to Kelly Gottesman and Juanita Anderson, who will talk specifically about production, because I know there's a lot of questions about production in the media arts and studies room and how that's going to work. And then finally, Jessica Greenwald is going to moderate the discussion, starting with the questions that you submitted in advance. And Dr. Cleo Moody will then also look at the chat to see what you uh, would ask that's along the way. Hopefully we're gonna answer a lot of the questions that we got in advance just through our conversation tonight. Um, but as I said, if not, there's gonna be time for more and we may need another town hall depending on how things go. Um, as I said, so you can keep your video off and keep yourself muted. You might wanna keep an eye out in the chat uh, because Dr. Moody will also post helpful links and things that come up that you might find useful. So without any further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our wonderful leader in the college, Dean Matthew Seeger. He is uh, actually a member of our department uh, and a former chair of the Department of Communication. So he has insider knowledge about us from that perspective. But also probably more importantly, he is also an expert in risk and crisis communication. So he lives and breathes what we're all experiencing right now from many different views. So at this point, I want to turn it over. Thank, thank you, Kat. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you today and, and sort of give you some sense of where we are going as a college and, and where we're going as a university. So. Uh, the first thing I will uh, do is I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I really want to express my thanks to the, the faculty and the staff in the Department of Communication for all they've done to pivot and be innovative and flexible in response to this, this event. You know, Kat mentioned that I spent a lot of time thinking and writing about crisis and disasters. One of the things we know about crisis situations is that people often uh, respond to these events in very positive and innovative and constructive ways. We call that emergent organization and we've seen a lot of it around this event and we're continuing to see it in, in the Department of Communication. So I just want to acknowledge how all the hard work and flexibility that people have brought to this, to this particular problem. This is a very uncertain and chaotic time for most of us. Uh, we don't yet have all the answers. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what things uh, will happen, how things will uh, roll out and, and what is going to happen. But we're working very hard to um, uh, get the answers. And uh, we have a number of uh, structures and systems set up so that we can uh, really have uh, good, good responses to the fall and, and the various contingencies that we face. So uh, 
when you face an uncertain circumstance like this and where you don't have all the answers, one of the things you try to do is, is develop some basic principles that you will follow. Uh, and President Wilson has really articulated three principles that are going to guide us in the fall as we begin to return to classes. <clears throat> the first principle is safety. As a medical doctor and an epidemiologist, clearly, you know, he privileges the safety, the health, and the well being of faculty, staff, and students. So that's really at the forefront front of everything that we're doing is this notion of ensuring that people are safe, doing everything we can to, to create a safe and secure learning environment as possible. And, and the plans that are put in place, I think, really are addressing that. The second principle is to continue to do the good business of the university and to pursue our core values. And our, our core activities and our core values have to do with excellence in teaching and learning, our research and service. And so we're really looking at how we have to adapt, how we can adapt, uh, what, what provisions we can put in place to ensure that the good work of the university is going to continue and that the education that students are going to receive and the learning that's going to happen is going to continue to be world-class. And we'll say that while COVID-19 has created many, many challenges around classroom and instruction, it's also created some interesting opportunities and it's really forced us to be innovative in our teaching, really you know, embrace technology in new ways, really think about innovative ways of delivering content and so there are, you know, some interesting things that are happening in the Department of Communication and some of our other programs, particularly our performing arts programs, as we, as we gravitate to, to new ways of delivering content. Um, and the third principle that uh, President uh, Wilson articulated is the idea that we need to learn and adapt as we go. And this gets back to this idea of uncertainty and how we don't have all the answers. We're going to have to you know, see how things go, see what's, how things work, and make adjustments as we go forward. And that adaptive process, that process of getting feedback and adaptive, adapting is going to be critical to our success going forward. So with those three principles, you know, what is the semester gonna look like in the fall? Well, based on what we know now, uh, most of our classes, a majority of our classes will be remote learning uh, circumstances. Uh, we will uh, continue to have some courses, some of our media arts courses, as, as Dr. McGuire mentioned, will probably continue to have some face-to-face -face components to them. Certainly the labs will have some of the face-to-face -face components to them, but a majority of our classes will be in a remote learning environment. Uh, some of our classes will be hybrid, where uh, some of the meetings will be face-to-face -face and some will be remote. We may stagger uh, meeting times so that we don't have as many students in a, in a particular class at a particular time. We are moving classes to new rooms to create more space so we can have more social distancing. We're creating physical uh, barriers in some cases between workstations uh, so that uh, we can maintain appropriate distancing between people. And everybody on campus will be required to wear a mask. So we're doing a lot of things, adapting both our procedures and our processes, but also the physical environment so that uh, we, we can maintain a safe learning environment. Our facilities people are working very, very hard, uh, working with us on, on a regular basis in terms of our planning. There are new systems for cleaning and ensuring that spaces, high contact spaces, are regularly cleaned to ensure that there is you know, no, no possibility of contacting the virus in those circumstances. So there's a lot of effort going into that. Many, many uh, committees have been put in place to be able to, to uh, ensure that we have those safe learning environments. So those are what we were planning in the fall. Um, these, these systems will adapt and change as we learn more, but that's what we're planning in the fall. I will direct you to three additional resources for additional information. The university is maintaining a COVID-19 website that provides regular updates about what's happening. The college also has a COVID-19 website that is linked to the university's website. I encourage you to visit that regularly. If you have additional questions about your courses, you may wish to contact your academic advisors 
They should be able to give you good information about the nature of a specific course. And if you need additional information, feel free to reach out to uh, the faculty members who are assigned to teach those courses. And if all else fails, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat and you can certainly feel free to email me. I do not have all the answers. That's the world we're living in. But I will certainly commit to trying to get you the answers in as timely a manner as possible. So thank you very much. It's an uncertain time. It's a crazy time. We're going to make it work. We're here for you. We're working hard to, to make sure that the, the environment, the learning environment is safe, that the good business of the university is going on, and that we're adapting as we go forward. So thank you very much. And again, I will put my email address in the chat. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Matt. So let me talk a little bit more about how we in the department have made our decisions. Um, as Matt said, safety is our absolute top priority. Safety for you, safety for faculty, safety for staff. But right up there with safety is pedagogy. In other words, how can we teach our classes to fulfill the learning outcomes that you've come to know and want and desire in our department? You know, for the classes you're turned it over to the faculty uh, and make by myself. They are the experts. They are the content experts for their course. And so what I did is I surveyed the faculty based on the classes that they are teaching and asked, do you want to think to fulfill your learning outcomes? Use do web asynchronous. So that means, you know, that it's just an online course. Do you want to do it synchronously uh, where you would meet at the same time or traditional? with all face-to-face -face or hybrid, which is a mix. Uh, and so the faculty made those decisions based on the needs of their class, based on their learning outcomes. So know that these decisions were made with both the goals of uh, pedagogy and safety in mind. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Vicki Dallas, our academic services officer, who's going to kind of talk a little bit more about what this is actually looking like on the registration system and what these actually mean. Uh, so Vicki. Thank you, Kat. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to walk you through some of the, the uh, scheduling changes that we have for the fall term. Um, let me say this, uh, when we planned the fall schedule, it was back in January. So we didn't know, uh, you know, that we were going to be having a, a pandemic. So when a lot of you registered in, uh, let's say, March, April, or May, your classes appeared uh, like we had planned them back in the winter. Uh, but, you know, pandemics change things, and so things have changed, and uh, you'll see the changes now in the schedule of classes. Uh, classes that are uh, mainly lecture and discussion and, and can be effectively delivered online have been moved online. Uh, classes that need some face-to-face -face meetings, uh, like we talked about production classes, will be online, but they're going to have on-campus meetings, and these meetings will be, um, you know, just a little bit different than traditional manner. Uh, there's going to be three categories of teaching methods, and you're going to, I'm going to show you samples of this in the schedule of classes. Um, there's going to be web, and if you look at COM 1010 that's on uh, the screen now, you'll see that this class says online course and building a range. So all of our COM 1010 classes this fall are, are going to be online, and, and you'll see this reflected in the schedule of classes. So that's one of the teaching methods, totally online. Uh, let's go to COM 1500. Another teaching method that you're going to see is called synchronous. And if you look at the first section of COM 1500, it says type synchronous. And there is uh, meeting days and meeting times. This means that this class is going to meet online but it's going to meet at very specific times and days. So you have to reserve that time slot, you know, in your, um, in your days, because that class will meet at that time and that, uh, on those days. Now, if you look at the second class, the second COM 1500 taught by Dr. Mormon, 
that class is what we call class, C-L-A-S. And that means that that class has actually two types of, meeting, of uh, teaching methods. It's going to meet on campus, and it's going to meet on campus on Wednesdays from 6 to 8.30, but it also is going to have an online component. Now, the way this is uh, structured is, uh, let's say we have a class of 20. It may be that 10 of those students will meet one, one week and 10 of those students will meet another week. And the reason for this is that we're trying to maintain the social distancing. Uh, all of the classrooms on campus have uh, been measured and mapped out and so that social distancing is going to be maintained. So we really can't put, uh, you know, a traditional size class back again into, you know, the classrooms that we're used to in the new game. So that's what this uh, class type of, of teaching method is. It's, it's actually what we used to call a hybrid. There's some meeting times uh, on campus and some meeting time and some online component of the course. You have to look at your syllabus that the instructors posted. The syllabus will guide you uh, as to when you're expected to be on campus, as well as your instructor will give you that guidance as well. So you, in that type of class, you have to really pay attention as to when you're expected on campus. Okay, so I hope that makes the scheduling is a little clearer. Uh, I know we've talked uh, about production classes. Uh, we'll probably meet in this class kind of format. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our multimedia specialist, uh, Kelly Gottesman, who's going to talk about a little bit more about those production classes. Kelly? Thanks, everyone. It's great to see people um, engaged and um, just um, carrying that Works forward as well as uh, learning new words. I, I like emergent organization. I'm going to kind of put that in my tool belt. Actually, Chris and I both were just talking about that. Um, if Kat can share a, a, a slide with us that I put together, that's kind of a this is a plan. And as we know, things can shift dramatically at any minute during this whole pandemic. But we are are warrior strong. We're uh, going to be putting plans together that um, have a, a bit of a flexibility to them as well, because we just don't know what might happen and when that might happen. So with that said, the um, roadmap for us over in our kind of production area, but it crosses through the whole campus. Um, I'm going to reiterate what both um, Kat and Matt said earlier, starting with safety. Safety is paramount, as we all know. So that Safe, these safety guidelines are uh, derivative from the CDC and the university and other um, leading uh, folks that are at the forefront of keeping us safe. So we have to do our part to do that. It's, it, we can ask everybody to wear masks, but everybody has to be diligent to do this and take that responsibility um, strongly. Uh, so wherever you are on campus, masks will be uh, you know, required. Uh, you need to do the warrior safe training. There's a daily screener that you will need to be um, participating in. Temperature checks, disinfecting. You guys heard this drill over and over, but hand sanitizing stations are being um, installed. And of course, social distancing. And how is that possible with some of the disciplines that we have? We're really in the trenches trying to work that through, as well as working with industry leaders um, that have already been kind of moving slowly back into production um, specifically. Um, so with that said, safety is first, safety is paramount. Um, and we're going to pretty much kind of enforce that safety as well. If you don't want to play by the rules, then you probably won't be working within our facilities. Um, it's really important to take care of yourself, but how you might infect or, you know, potentially others. So we need to take that seriously. As far as the mirror goes, we're still gonna operate um, with a limited uh, kind of check-in, check-out schedule. As of uh, right now, we're working what days those might be. So students can have access to equipment that is um, geared right to their uh, production courses. So um, how do we do this? We're even talking about uh, a, another location on maybe the ground floor for a 
uh, COVID check-in center so that it mitigates against a lot of foot travel all the way up through one elevator to the fourth floor, as many of you guys know. Um, so uh, not only will we kind of try to reduce foot traffic on the equipment check-in and check-out, but we do have the ability to also have isolated edit suites for those who um, cannot use the remote um, online uh, interfaces that we're going to talk about but need to be on campus to do their coursework. So we, we're setting things up for that as well um, to, again, uh, follow CDC guidelines, et cetera, um, as well as the university uh, mandates. Um, the other part of this whole thing about um, production classes, thank you, Vicki, for kind of at least clearing up what, you know, hybrid and class and um, the other, uh, you know, uh, labels are but your instructor would be the first person to be able to kind of, if you have a question, to identify how they will be um, drafting their class for the fall. Um, so for us, it's gonna have a combination of online lectures and in-person labs. We've done, as uh, Vicki mentioned as well, a kind of space audit measuring square footage using the divide by 113 to figure out how many bodies we can get into a room safely. But it's more than that because there's you know, traffic flow and things that we all have to consider. Um, so we'll have smaller in face-to-face -face, uh, labs in the uh, media arts equipment room in our production uh, facilities. Um, but those are being organized now. Juanita uh, Anderson, myself, and Kelly Donlin were talking yesterday about um, how we're going to try to approach this and move forward. Um, and then we're producing a lot of online content that would normally be um, uh, given in a lab environment where you're demonstrating a camera, et cetera, um, to be supplemental so that they can, the students can refer back to these as uh, learning modules and be tested out on, which will um, hopefully be up and running middle of August. We're, we're, we're now producing, so hold tight for the delivery. Um, that's kind of a large brushstroke of the production classes. I don't know if Juanita wants to jump in and say anything more about that element. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, your instructors are working very diligently um, and do not have many of the answers at this point. So I know that a lot of you are anxious to know the answers to all of your questions and we just simply don't have them at this moment, but rest assured that we will be working to provide safe environment and we're planning, um, keeping my fingers crossed that we do not hit any road bumps in terms of an increase with COVID that would cause us to have to change our planning. Um, but again, it's always a possibility, but we understand the importance of giving you um, the opportunity, giving students the opportunity to really hone in their crafts and work on their productions uh, with first rate equipment. And that is what our aim is on that. I do want to mention that one of the things that we're doing right now, uh, just two weeks ago, the major industry unions, uh, Directors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, IATSE, the Teamsters, as well as the Producers Guild, um, who have been working on this since April uh, in terms of safety guidelines, and they have changed, of course, as this pandemic has changed. Finally, we're able to publish what they call a white paper, which is guidelines, safety protocols for productions um, primarily they're designed for those that are Hollywood based, but they provide really solid industry standards. Um, so we're working now to gain knowledge from those protocols and try to develop protocols for our students for when they are doing production to, to ensure their safety. We have not finalized those, they're in progress. Uh, they will go through the university for approval. Um, but we want, just wanted to let you know that we are working to ensure that you, if at all possible, you will have the opportunity to develop your creative and technical skills um, in your film and media arts and studies programs. But part of the new normal as you're learning production protocols, we'll be learning new 
and putting into practice new safety protocols because that is the new normal that we're dealing with now. True. And I think uh, that um, guide, that white paper, that's 36 pages, will, um, there's great information in there that will guide and steer how we're going to move forward. Some of it's obviously outside of our realm to be able to do, but having healthcare professionals on set as, um, you know, deemed that they have is, I think, a really good way to monitor some of this if we're able to go out and shoot in certain situations. But those are, again, like our, our Dean mentioned, there's, um, we don't have all the answers, but we're, we're definitely putting a roadmap forward with a, a plan that will push us into being able to uh, disseminate high quality instruction, get your hands on production equipment, and be able to still um, continue through, especially those who kind of have their required classes, senior status, um, we feel for you, we understand, but um, we're moving forward with the best uh, tools that we have at our disposal. And speaking of those tools, um, uh, Chris Gilbert, one of our IT folks, uh, along with um, Chris Scalese and Gary Sandrowski, um, we're working with Splashtop. Splashtop is a, uh, is a software that um, can be installed on your computer. It allows you to remote access into from your device to a computer uh, anywhere as long as you have uh, privileges to do so. And we're working on a, a method to do that. I was actually working through it today with Kelly Donlin. Um, so think about it like this, you're on your device at home, you log in through Splashtop and you will have a bank of uh, computers that you can sit at. So it would be like sitting in the media arts equipment room in one of the edit suites and you would have access to all the software um, and uh, be able to even remote into our media server there. Um, we're working out the kinks. There are some, but it is a way to be able to still um, teach. I'm going to use it in a synchronous way with my 1610 class, and so will Paul, um, our new hire. And I think that's going to work out really well, uh, but it affords us the opportunity to um, expand our reach. We're actually uh, going to have 40 plus computers just for our media arts students, so that almost doubles what we normally would have. Um, we're making other considerations, of course, for those who need to come in for face-to-face -face instruction, and we will be set up to, to handle that as well. So things will um, be shored up a little bit more as we roll into the middle of July. Um, new information um, will start to surface. I'm sure we'll have probably another town hall or smaller meetings with different individuals to um, get trained up on things because there will be new protocol, new policy, and even our web checkout interface that we use for reserving equipment and reserving space has gone under a big update. And so there's new um, training involved with that as well. Um, but all of this um, is in respect to making the best out of a not so good situation um, and um, continue on with our education and our teaching. So bear with us as we do push forward and um, we don't have all the answers, but we are working to make this a viable and teachable moment for all of us um, throughout, you know, what we can work with in the fall. So um, if you have questions about any of the things that I just mentioned here, please address that in the chat. And um, for me, for Juanita or any of our production faculty, because I know many of you guys were asking, how do we, do we have access to equipment? If we don't have access, do we still have to pay the money? You know, good, legit question. I get it. Um, I don't have the answer for that one, but you will have access to the equipment. Thank you so much, Kelly and Juanita. And that splash top capability is going to work also for our journalism students who all go into the fifth floor, that splash top isn't just for the production students, but it's for all of our students who would normally be taking their classes in a lab environment. That could be digital photojournalism, it could be news reporting, um, you know, and there will also be digital labs for everybody. So, you know, so that splash top is a really fantastic resource. And I know they're producing videos on how to do that, uh, and then we'll be uh, bringing more of that on board. So at this point in time, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica. Um, who can talk then about uh, some of the questions that maybe uh, were asked in advance that haven't been yet answered. Uh, as I said, we have all of our program 
uh, directors on this call as well as all of our area heads and so we might be calling on some of you to jump in and ask particular questions whether it's prssa whether it's uh, the communication studies graduate programs and so for now i'd like to turn it over to all right, well, hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, what I will do is go through, like Kat said, the questions that were submitted in advance. However, if you have thought of something during this meeting that you might not have had a chance to submit, please feel free to go ahead and throw it in um, our chat. And Dr. Cleo Moody is there monitoring it and we can pick up those questions as we go along as well. Um, so please, I invite you to do that um, as we're moving through this section. Um, so the first question will be going out to Victoria Dallas. Um, the students would like to know when will the class instruction methods be officially decided for all fall courses? Um, they, they've been decided. Uh, if you look at the schedule of classes now, you'll see how your class will be taught, whether it will be online, whether it will be synchronous, or whether it will be class, which is the type of class that it will have some, uh, you know, some meet time on campus. So if you're not seeing that, send me um, an email. I'm vdallas at wayne.edu with a specific class uh, that you have a question about, and I'll see if I can answer it for you. But it, the schedule of classes now will reflect, as far as we know now, how fall classes will be taught. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the next question will be going um, to Dr. McGuire. Um, that would be how will students um, know or when will they know that their class is canceled if that happens? Will they have time to go back in and um, register for something else on their schedule? Yeah, we monitor registration on a fairly regular basis. Uh, we understand that a lot of you might have been hesitant to go ahead and register because of all of the uncertainty that we've been hearing about. You didn't know about the instruction. You didn't know about. With that being said, we're hoping that tonight will give you the information you need to feel confident to go ahead and make those choices. Uh, to work with your advisor to go ahead and schedule the classes that will work best for you and your current situation. Um, you know, when we get the numbers in there, I feel much more confident. Um, as you all have heard, there are budget issues going around at campuses all over the United States, and we are in the middle of our own conversations. But with that said, so far our registrations are looking fairly robust. Um, our graduate students, you know, we would like to see more graduate enrollment. I know those numbers are a little low. You've been hesitating because you've had a lot of questions. Hopefully that this is giving you the answers you need to go forward. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question, and I know uh, Kelly Gottesman had a, alluded to it earlier. Um, one of the questions is, if classes go online, will I pay less money? Um, Unfortunately, no, that is not the case. Um, the tuition rates have stayed the same. Um, tuition has not gone up, which is a fantastic thing. Um, but you can find all of those rates on the Wayne State website. If you just search in the main uh, search box for tuition and fees, you can bring up those um, prices to see what that is. That being said, um, as everyone has alluded, our faculty have been working tirelessly since this whole thing started months ago. Um, to deliver the same quality of instruction that you would be receiving in the classrooms. Um, so there has been a lot of planning going on this summer and you should feel confident in the way that the, the information is going to be delivered to you. So that being said, again, if you have questions about tuition, you can look at those tuition and fees. You can also talk to um, financial aid as well. They are running up and running remotely and have people staffed, I believe, every day from 9 until 4.30. Um, the next question would be for, um, re regarding student groups, like student um, PRSSA, SPJ, things like that. And students are wondering how those outside of the classroom activities are going to look in this new kind of remote environment. So if Shelly or Kim or Kelly 
um, can address the student groups in those areas, that would be fantastic. So with our students that are in production, we, based on square footage again, and CDC guidelines, we can safely get seven students plus one uh, instructor and uh, an assistant in the classroom, in that production classroom. So we're working from that number for most, if not all of our production classes. Um, we have 16 edit suites that can safely, um, because they're kind of like isolation booths, um, Obviously, we will have what we call quarantine time as soon as uh, a student exits uh, a thorough cleaning of all, you know, shared surfaces. Um, and we're kind of practicing that now. But uh, smaller groups, think of it as a little uh, kind of family group um, that will pretty much stay together throughout the term um, to kind of keep people in the similar groups as far as how we're at least approaching our production courses. Um, Kim, do you have anything you want to say about that? Uh, well, I wanted to talk about SPJ, um, the uh, Society for Professional Journalists chapter. Because of the COVID closure and happening very quickly, um, both the president and vice president of the chapter graduated, and we were unable to um, hold elections for new officers. But Perry Farrell will be taking over as the new SPJ faculty advisor in the fall. I'm the uh, auxiliary advisor for that organization as the area head in journalism and a member of SPJ. So we plan to, in whatever way possible, hold elections in the fall, even if it's virtually. The SPJ chapter is fairly small in terms of numbers. Um, so that's yet to be determined, but uh, we got special permission from the national uh, chapter to hold elections, um, you know, coming into the fall. Uh, we've alerted uh, Wayne State about that. It, of course, everybody's being very, you know, very understanding. Um, Metro Arts isn't exactly a student group. It's a class. Um, but right now, pending uh, being told not to, um, we should be able to do appropriate social distancing. Uh, Dean Seeger and I have had uh, just a little bit of interaction talking about doing some segments on uh, impact of arts organizations on COVID, et cetera. So you may not have seen the press release, but it did fire out today that we were able to launch our ninth season um, this month. I went in during quarantine and got the shows ready to go. So those are the two organizations I can speak to. I know that, I'm not sure if Alicia Nails is on this uh, call, but she could probably talk about the Journalism Institute, uh, the gym program, if possible. But I know Jim is having, I believe, a a special uh, virtual panel discussion on some issues already this next week. So as far as I know, and I hope if Shelly's on, she can talk about PRSSA, but I think everything's proceeding forward, even if it's, you know, uh, in, a, in a Zoom or, you know, more of a virtual environment. So, you know, when, when we get details, we'll, we'll pass those along. The, uh, the Journalism Institute, we uh, still meet bi-weekly over by Zoom, and we'll be having activity throughout the summer and, of course, in the fall. And uh, we're taking in, uh, at this point, five new members, but certainly if people are interested in applying for membership, we do rolling admissions. So the Journalism Institute is up and running. <laughs> is Shelly here to speak to um, PRSSA at all? Um, Let's see. I, I think, think she might have had technical problems. Shelly? No, I'm Oh, you're I'm here. here. Okay, good. Okay. I, oh, I, oh, good. You can hear me now? Okay, good. Yes, I don't know I why. Find her. Okay, sure. Sure. So, PRSSA, um, we are equipped to handle our pre professional development opportunities that we typically offer throughout the semester virtually. We've already had a little bit of practice holding the um, the one, I, gosh, I already forgot when it was, March or April, uh, where we uh, featured Ray Day, or we partnered anyways to feature Ray Day about what, this, what the future looks like for, for PR uh, new grads and all of that. And so we've already been talking and have a few ideas. So um, because it's sort of in our wheelhouse for, for our, in, you know, in our skill set and sort of expected of us, um, I think that we will be okay um, this fall uh, in terms of now in terms of our, our peer SSA membership drive that might look a little bit different being virtual um, because there's such a, a stronger impact you know when the students are are speaking and face to face in their classes about the benefits of, of joining and all of that but we will um, our officers have already been elected that happened in April 
So I think we are in good shape. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, I also know that the Dean of Students Office has um, a bunch of their student organizations still going up and running. The South End is still going to continue on, Wayne Radio. Um, there are being plans made for those. So if you want to check out the Dean of Students Office, if you're involved in any organizations outside of our department, um, you can get more information on the plans for those. Um, the next question is one that I will be able to answer. Um, it is, is, student, is school starting this year like some other schools in the state? Or is it starting early this year? Or are we changing our calendar at all? Um, as of right now, our classes are starting to, um, they're going to start on schedule on Tuesday, September 1st, and will run for the full semester. Again, if you'd like to see the academic calendar for this year, you can search academic calendar in the main Wayne State website, and you can see the, um, the current schedule for this year has been finalized. So it will follow the exact, exact same uh, patterns as it has in previous semesters. So um, again, that is the plan for now. If there's any need to switch again to everything very remote, we will let you know as that occurs. Um, but for right now, September 1st is, is go time. Um, the next question is about IT support for the department. So I know Chris Scalisi is one of our fantastic IT representatives for CFPCA and is on this call. So um, I don't know if you wanna to speak to a little bit about what instructors and students can expect towards um, getting support from you guys. Sure, um, I, can, I can take this one with Kelly as well. Um, again, we have, uh, we've been using Splashtop uh, quite a bit over the summer so that uh, students can remote into the uh, into labs uh, to be able to use the computers. We've also come up with um, a way that uh, faculty can remote into the same computer that a student is using and actually help them out while the student is working, doing an editing project, um, whatever, whatever they need. So those are our two big main IT pushes for, for what we need to do um, uh, for faculty and, and for students. Um, as far as faculty go, we're always the front line. If there are any questions about um, synchronous or asynchronous teaching, about Zoom, anything like that, we'll do our best to answer. And if we can't, we can always escalate it to CNIT. Um, so any questions that faculty have when it comes to something not working uh, correctly, uh, we can always uh, either try and solve it ourselves or escalate it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. We're trying to get equipment out to faculty uh, to be able to do uh, teaching over, over Zoom. Um, so that they're able to have the right equipment that they need. Um, and again, uh, using Splashtop is, is, a, is a great resource for students and for uh, faculty. Um, Splashtop, you can use that on a Chromebook, you can use that on an iPad, um, on any device, uh, which, which makes it really nice. Um, like it, Kelly said, we've been working out a lot of the kinks um, to get everything working the correct way. I know that video editing uh, requires a lot of processing power and um, you know just a, a lot of fine tuning, and uh, we're trying to really fine tune that with Splashtop. So it's like you're literally sitting in that seat doing uh, doing video editing. Yeah, to tag off on that, it, you know, it's great when it works, um, but there will be some little pitfalls as we all get acquainted with this new normal. The um, we're a little bit at the mercy of your connection speed because um, that's how you get in. But once you're in, it's basically using the infrastructure that's on campus. So you're sitting at a desktop there. For those working in lighter application, you probably won't see any latency at all for those working in maybe photography or uh, other disciplines like film like we are. Um, it, it does have some latency issues at times. And so we're just gonna have to work within the limitations of that um, aspect. Um, we're also working towards um, identifying students who have needs um, that uh, might need a computer or something like that. So, um, and we're making uh, those things available. So we're working on various surveys to be able to push out to our students in order to recognize and uh, actually find out what people need. 
Um, we started that back obviously in the winter term when we, for the last five weeks, but we're gonna continue that kind of surveying to make sure that no student gets left behind. Those who need to be in a face-to-face -face environment have that ability to do so and do it safely. Perfect, and then Shelly, could you give us um, a quick update on how you are teaching your, your classes from the instructor perspective to talk about how the synchronous um, classes are going and um, just to give us a little, little insight into that. Sure, am I unmuted right now? Nope, you're good. <laughs> oh, good, okay, good. So sure, so and some of the other professors may be doing this as well. My um, class will be a combination of synchronous and online. So what that's going to look like is um, perhaps once a week, maybe um, once every other week, I will, and I will have this scheduled, of course, ahead of time, so this the students know, and it will be during class time when we will meet synchronously over Zoom, but it will be sort of a check-in point where we can see each other, I can um, clarify any issues um, with assignments or maybe talk through some things that are just um, a little bit more complex that I think that I need to actually talk through instead of, um, you know, write through. <laughs> so I, I have found over the spring term that, that it was very helpful for both the students and I. What I also plan to do is record those sessions, though. So I will record those Zoom sessions and post them. So for two reasons. First, so the, if the student is unable to sign on during a particular time, even though it is during class time and they will be expected to do so, if they, if they are unable, um, they will have access to the information provided through the recording. And secondly, so that students that were there can go back to it. If, if um, for instance, they need to refresh their memory or clarify something. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, though all of the assignments and, 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 and readings and um, will all be in weekly modules. That seemed to work really well. Um, but again, those um, that opportunity once every week or once every other week to connect via Zoom um, seems to be really helpful. So, and also the other thing that I plan on continuing to do is to record mini lectures. I don't know what, I didn't know what to call them. I called them mini lectures. And they were um, like 10 to 15 minute lectures um, or descriptions, like assignment descriptions. And I used video, so I was actually talking to the students and explaining assignments because in, uh, sometimes it's just too um, complex to really maybe put it in writing. So I would put it in writing and I would talk through it and I would just upload um, my little 10 to 15 minute uh, recording of me talking about whatever I needed to talk about that week. And sometimes there were two or three of them that I uploaded. Um, so I do, if for, the, for the students that are on this call, um, I do want to uh, reiterate and, uh, to you the importance of listening to those recordings because I am going to come up with a way through Canvas to um, make sure that the students see the recording and for those faculty there are, that are on call, um, that there are ways to make sure that the students um, view the recording before they go into the assignment. So that's, going, that's something that I learned, so that the students um, uh, tend to go right to the assignment sometimes without receiving instruction first. So. Um, for both students and faculty, there's, that's a little FYI there. So, anyways, that's what I'm doing my, um, and I quite few students as well. So, uh, that's how I plan to do it: is is the combination synchronous slash online. So it's not the synchronous face to face; it's the synchronous combo online. That's what I plan on doing. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Shelley. Um, another question that I'm seeing in the chat right now is. Um, maybe one to go out to Kelly Gottesman and Chris Galisi again, um, is what assistance are being provided to students and faculty who have um, problems or issues with reliable internet access? So I just, um, I just looked that up on Wayne State's website. Um, 
and there is actually a, a web page devoted right to that. Uh, for internet service providers, cellular carriers offering free and discounted services, um, that's a good place to start. Um, I know that CNIT had a few, uh, what are called little hotspot devices for students and for faculty. Um, if they didn't have uh, wireless access or they couldn't get reliable wireless access. Um, I also know that uh, CNIT advised you can have some students park or sit by campus uh, because they're doing a Wi-Fi web for our WSU Secure. So that that's an option as well. So that's a that's a real difficult challenge. It's been a difficult challenge from K through 12 through higher ed. You know, it's all these things that we've uh, that we've got are great. Splash Top is great. Uh, Zoom is great. Uh, you know, Canvas is great. But if students can't get to them, uh, that's it's a difficulty. So it's a uh, it's a work in progress. We're going to do our best to make sure that everybody has access to the technology that um, that they need in order to to do the things that they need to do. So I don't know, Kelly, if you want to add to that. No, I mean. The surveys that we're putting out there or will be putting out there will hopefully identify these needs and that we can address them before and be proactive before, you know, the students in the middle of something and we realize, wait a minute, they can't connect. And in this particular world that we're living in, connection is key. And so we need to make sure, um, like Chris said, CNIT is, and I see that uh, Cleo put the link in our chat. Um, has some really good resources from not only just internet providers, but themselves offering, like Chris said, hotspots. Um, I even had a student um, park and there are lots, I don't know if that's on the web somewhere that are identified as um, Wi-Fi parking lots. So you could sit there, not that that's a great, you know, alternative, but to sit there and access the Wayne State um, Wi-Fi and do your coursework, so. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, the next question is both one that we've received in advance and one that has come up on the chat. Um, and maybe Kat would like to take a first stab at this one. Um, the, the students are asking if they have an underlying illness or um, they have some kind of um, learning disability maybe where that's preventing them from doing online learning. How will the faculty be working with the student? Um, and how should they go about you know, finding that assistance? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, now, I know that, that Student Disability Services is probably working hand in hand with so many other groups on campus and restart to make sure that accommodations for those who have documented um, issues can be can still have accommodations and can still we can still honor their learning needs uh, and so if people do have specific issues um, you know that they can talk to SDS they can talk to their instructors uh, and advisors so I do know that they are working I know that CNIT has been making sure that Canvas and Zoom and everything is accessible um, for those who might have visual impairments auditory impairments um, you know, everything like that. So I know that SDS has been working um, very closely with, with C19 and everyone else as part of the restart. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in about accommodations. I do know that one of the themes is that we try to be flexible to work with students to accommodate our learning goals. I know some people really do have an honest fear of being on campus um, for, and for good reason. And so I I encourage you to reach out to your instructor if you have concerns that might make your ability to learn the method given um, you know work with them and also talk to your advisors about organizing your schedule in a way that's going to work for you and that might mean seeing if you can maybe wait to do a class in winter when we might have more information so I don't know if anyone I can certainly jump in um... I'm Tanya Thomas. I'm the teacher of COM 2310. Um, and web accessibility is one of the things I actually teach in my course. I do know that uh, our Office of Teaching and Learning has been working very diligently with faculty to teach them how to make their courses accessible, uh, not just from a disability standpoint, but from a learning 
preferences standpoint so that there are multiple ways for <coughs> folks to intake their information. We all have preferences whether we have disabilities or not. So we're all, many of us are already very keen on trying to build our courses that way. And the, the, the group of us is, is growing on how we can capably do that for you students. At, um, on a broader sense, Zoom, if you record a lecture, it does have transcription available or it will be available when we start. So anything that's recorded, um, students that have uh, maybe a hearing disability will be accommodated. Um, I don't know what they're planning to do from a visual aspect. Um, there, there are actually a lot of things that are going on from that aspect. Uh, Zoom recordings, uh, there has to be some upload that happens. Uh, so it's not, an, it's not necessarily an instant thing that happens. Your instructors are being taught, those who don't know, they're being taught to upload those recordings to platforms that will do transcription for those that are uh, hearing impaired. There are other platforms that we have across campus, like Microsoft Stream, which US students have an account. You can make use of Microsoft Stream. It's part of your Office 365 uh, package. Uh, many of us are using that because it does automatic transcription as well. Even for some of the live things that we're doing for folks, it's transcribing um, as, as we're speaking. So uh, we're thinking about that. We're thinking about um, using audio descriptions. We're thinking about making sure that our documents are completely navigable from a uh, assistive technology perspective. We're making sure that our web media has captions and alternate text and all kinds of things. Um, there are many of us who are doing this already and have done it for years. There are some who are just learning. So we're gonna ask you as students to partner with us in your learning. Make sure that we know what your needs are so that we can provide for you or get the help that we need to provide for you. And thank you, Tanya. Um, I would say the biggest thing in, and I have several other um, questions about, you know, what if what if students are, um, they, they get COVID and they need to take some time off class. And I would say the biggest thing for students is to make sure you're really in communication with your faculty, make sure you're staying up to date with your email, your Canvas pages, all of those sorts of things. Um, so those problems can be addressed th the moment they come up. Um, we can talk about, you know, you would work with your faculty member to see what would be available, you know, to make sure that you are taking care of yourself first. And you can also work with your advisor where if, you know, you have, you end up getting a prolonged illness, what would that look like for you? Would, would a medical withdrawal be something that we're going to consider? So really just be in communication with your faculty and your advisor throughout this if any problems come up. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up very soon. I know we are taking up a lot of your evening, so we will continue that. Kelly um, Young, would you like to put in a quick little plug for the grad town hall on Monday? Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, on Monday, we're going to address a lot of, there were a number of questions related to the graduate program and graduate classes and graduate processes <clears throat> that I knew we wouldn't have time to address tonight. So Monday, I linked it in the very beginning of the Zoom group chat. If you're coming late to us, uh, scroll back up there. I also sent this out over the MA and PhD com listservs. Uh, but we'll address a lot of those questions Monday evening. I'm going to record it, figure out some way to post and distribute that information as well, so that if you can't make it Monday, uh, you can at least watch the video and find answers to your questions. So that'll be on Monday at 4 p.m. Perfect. Thank you. And then I'll throw it back to Kat for our closing remarks. Well, again, thank you all for being here. Stay tuned. And the good news is you're in a department of communication and if communication is key you're in the right place um, some of the things that are going to be coming up we are going to be uh, doing our first e-newsletter and it's going to be called uh, word on the street student edition so this is dedicated uh, for students and that we are producing that now and you all get to see as i said it'll be like look like today at wayne it's going to you know be a, an embedded one into email 
Uh, we'll also be using methods like that to communicate, and if another town hall is needed, we will do it. So please feel free to contact your advisor. You can contact me, contact your faculty members if you have questions, uh, because it's your questions that help guide how we're gonna go forward through this time of uncertainty. So again, thank you all very much and be safe, be well, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.